The phrase that we're looking at today in the creed is this, is seated at the right hand of the Father and will come again to judge the living and the dead. Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father and will come again to judge the living and the dead. So I want to start off with a picture, actually a couple, one of them you'll really enjoy. Uh, This is a picture of my granddad. This is Gerald Johns. Uh, My grandmother is still alive, but uh, Grandpa Johns, Jerry Johns, uh, died when I was about 12. Hard life of drinking and smoking caught up with him and took him early. He didn't come to Christ until later in life. Uh, My granddad was uh, part American Indian, uh, enough that you could look at him and look at his eyes and you could see it, but not so much that you could look at me, any part of me, and see any of it. (laughs) That's how that worked out. Um, and my grandpa was kind of a bit of a hero to me as a young kid. I grew up in Southern California, but they lived in Traverse City, Michigan, and we would travel back in August for about a month, and I would get to go for a ride in grandpa's two-tone Chevy Cheyenne truck, and he would take me up to the lake that he had helped to build once upon a time, and he would take me past the streams, or as he called them, cricks where he fished, and he would uh, take me to Cedar Lake in his little aluminum boat, and we would fish for bass, and he would tell me stories of pike and muskie. He would talk about deer hunting, and at the end of the hallway was this rifle case that I had my face pressed against for, you know, just hours over the course of our visit as I looked at each one in there. What's that one? What does that one do? That's a big one. That's, you know... (laughs) And here are all these rifles. And I'm blessed that I actually inherited a majority of them uh, when he passed away. Um, None of them are valuable. And to me, all of them are invaluable, right? Uh, So that's how that goes. But for me, as a kid from Southern California, I I just love to engage with his life and his stories. He served in the military. He was a minesman uh, for the SEALs and the Navy and uh, served in World War II and the Korean War. Uh, And then after he got out, he opened a garage and worked on little import cars, MGs and Triumphs and Fiats, and uh, just a handful of those cars in town kept him in business. So that's what he did. Um, But there was always this sorrow for me when Grandpa passed uh, because I wanted to be more a part of that life and learn more and more about him. And, um, And so when he died and I was about 12, 13 years old, I really regretted it. It was really a deep sorrow for me. It was the first time I had lost someone close to me. And I remember at that time thinking, Grandpa's somewhere else. Where is he? What's he doing? Can he see me? Does does he have a body? What's he caring about? I'm confident of his faith, so somehow he is with the Lord, even though he does not yet have his resurrected or glorified body. But in what way is he there with the Lord? And in what way is he aware of me? Suddenly, my my young mind was sort of cast into heaven in a new way to think about it. And I want to turn some of those same questions back as we think about Christ, as we think about Jesus. He died, he was buried. We know that he is no longer on earth in bodily form. He rose from the dead and he ascended into the air bodily. He did not simply vanish, right? He ascended to a place. And I think that leaves us with some very reasonable questions. Where is Jesus now? What is Jesus like right now? What is this glorified body that he presently has that we're waiting for? What's he up to? What does he have planned for the future? What is Jesus doing? And these are some questions that I think are really good questions as we think about not only his resurrection, but his bodily ascension. And the creed addresses these uh, questions for us. In the first statement here, we have, oh, by the way, this is proof that Eric had hair. This is me as a (laughs) 12-year-old hanging out with my sister Katrina and grandpa on the deck. And one of the, this is just, 
an aside, he would sit there with his slingshot, and as the rabbits came into his garden, he'd just shoot them off the deck. I thought that was pretty cool. I find myself now with a pellet gun shooting squirrels off of my deck, so it's funny how some of those things stay in the family. The first line of our creed, he, or of our creed for today, he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. This is mentioned many times uh, throughout the New Testament. I want to look at what Paul has to say about this in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 18 through 23, if you want to turn there. Ephesians 1, starting at verse 18. This is one of those beautiful prayers uh, that Paul writes to the uh, believers in Ephesus. Ephesians 1.18, he says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, and the incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. Far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. So here the Apostle Paul is encouraging the believers in Ephesus regarding their future hope to which they've been called and about the present power available to them through the Holy Spirit for their discipleship to Christ. And he encourages them with these realities. As he does so, he gives us a picture of the current place and activity of Jesus. He is at the right hand of the Father. And what should we take from that? To be seated at the right hand of the Father, this is a place of honor. The Father has honored the Son for the work that he has done. This is something that was prophesied even by David in Psalm 110 when he says, The Lord said to my Lord, and this is the conversation between the Father and the Son. I don't think David had this all figured out in his mind. But the Lord, Yahweh, said to my Lord, this future coming king, which we would find out to be Jesus, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. It was prophesied. It's also proclaimed by the Apostle Paul here in Ephesus and by the Apostle Peter as early on as Acts 2, right? When he states that this, this Christ, this one that Jesus, or who God has made uh, Messiah and Lord, is now exalted at the right hand of God. And, and this honored place at the Father's right hand was also glimpsed or envisioned, if you will, by Stephen. Do you remember in Acts 7 when Stephen gives his beautiful gospel speech, even as they're, they're trying him, the Sanhedrin is trying him and getting ready to stone him and to take his life, he looks into heaven and he envisions Christ at the right hand of the Father. In verse 55, Acts seven fifty-five, it says, but Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. At this, they covered their ears, yelling at the top of their voices, and they all rushed at him, dragged him out of the city, and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. He envisioned the glorified Christ standing at the right hand of the Father. And in Philippians 2, a very familiar passage, again, it reminds us that the Father has exalted him, right? Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So the point that I want to focus on here is that Jesus is not merely gone from earth, but rather he has gone to a place. He's gone to a place where he has regained the glory that he had before his incarnation. He is glorified. 
Uh, Additionally, Jesus doesn't merely rise from the dead, but this glorified body that he has, that we got a glimpse of while he was here on earth, is a picture for us of the body we will one day get, as I love to say, bodies to die for. They will be bodies to die for. I've been working on that body to die for for a long time, but Jesus is going to have to give it to me because the gym won't quite do it. But Jesus lifted off the earth and he lives now in the place of honor and exaltation at the Father's right hand. And the scriptures tell us that presently all of the angels are subject to him And according to Revelation 5, that beautiful passage we read earlier, in fact, I won't read it again just because we did read it together, surround him constantly singing, worthy is the lamb who was slain. In my own imagination, I think about this. They knew the glorified Christ before his incarnate state. They knew of his holiness. They knew of his sonship. They knew of his deity. And now they know of something new. They know of his grace and his mercy and his forgiveness and his willingness to step into our place and to take our punishment. I have to think that the angels learned and even grew in their appreciation in the glory of Christ, and they sing about it presently. And what I want to bring home to you is this. This is the Jesus that we worship. Not just a dead teacher or a mild-mannered miracle worker, and not just merely a sacrificial savior, but one who is high and lifted up and exalted and reigning presently and advocating for us to the Father along with the Holy Spirit on the basis of his finished work on the cross for us. And I pray that this is the portrait that you have in mind when you lift your heart and your voice and your prayers to God. I hope this is who you envision. This portrait, I think, has just very um, practical implications for us. It should give us confidence in our prayers. This is who we are praying to and through. It is he who gives us access to the throne room of heaven. It should give us trust because of uh, his power. And it should give us zeal for his return. The second uh, word I want to draw attention to in this first sentence here is that he is seated. So he's at the right hand, which is this honored position, but he is seated. And this is sometimes referred to as Christ's session, his session, where he is in the heavens, glorified and exalted, but he is seated because his work of atonement is finished. He sat down, it was finished. Um... You guys know, or some of you know, I just got back from a goat hunt. And I will say, and the the fellow that went with me, I'm not going to dime him out here, but the fellow that went with me out hiked me, put me to shame. He's 65, 20 years my senior. And I was the one saying, could we rest, please? (laughs) And when we got off the mountain, and it was arduous, I stumbled over to our tent, and I had brought a little camp chair, and I sat down. And I've never been so happy to sit down in my life. Uh, I would say it's, it's fair to say that that was the hardest thing I've done physically. To be that long on the mountain and have that arduous uh, descent and to sit down and have it completed was so satisfying. When Christ sat down, it was not because he was fatigued, but because he was satisfied. He had satisfied the payment for you and for me. He is seated The work of atonement is finished. That doesn't mean that the redemptive story of God is absolutely punctuated, but it means that the plot has been written and determined and finished. Christ is seated, a sign of his finished work. And we'll talk about his return in a minute. Hebrews 1, 3 captures this. The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word, After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. So he became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. Now, a few moments ago, I read uh, from Acts, and we talked about Acts 7 and Stephen's speech and his vision of heaven. So here I'm talking about that Christ is seated. And some of you might go, wait a minute. 
when Stephen looked into heaven, what did he see? He saw him standing. He saw him standing. So maybe some of you skeptics will go, see, there's a contradiction in Scripture. And I will tell you, not at all. Just because Christ is seated doesn't mean he has the seatbelt on. <laughs> it doesn't mean he doesn't ever move or do anything. That would be an overly wooden or not just literal, but literalistic interpretation. And I will tell you this. I choose to believe this. This is a bit speculative. But I choose to believe that weeks after Christ's ascension, honored and exalted, at the right hand of the Father, seated, fully attentive to what is happening on earth, looking down and sees Stephen and stands with attention as he anticipates receiving who would be the first martyr of the Christian church. I choose to believe that from his seated position to the vision that Stephen has. Stephen is one who rightly recognized the gospel story threaded throughout all of Israel's history in the Old Testament. He is the one who refuses to be silent about proclaiming it in the face of the Sanhedrin. Stephen is one who will follow in the footsteps of his Savior, willing to die for the truth, and does so. And I choose to believe that the exalted Christ glorified, seated at the honored right-hand side of the Father who was worshipped and sung over by angels as attentive to earth, seeing Stephen and rises to recognize and receive the first martyr of the Christian church. Jesus does not rise restlessly, wringing his hands with worry or concern, but I believe he rose to welcome home a faithful servant. So the ascension of Christ and the present place uh, of Jesus seated at the Father's side. This is not just something to know, but again, it has implications for us. And the author of Hebrews in chapter 12 leverages his exhortation for us to be faithful in our discipleship upon this. He says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. And I think that is what we need to take home by way of application. Life's hard, throws us curveballs. There are things that come into our life we didn't see coming and they wreck us. And we are to consider him, what he has done, what he has gone through, and where he is now. And that is to animate our discipleship. Secondly, we see this, he will return, or in the language in the creed, he will come again. And the idea here, of course, is that Jesus, who came to earth once in humility, in great humility, will return again in great glory. And that is the promise of Christ himself. In fact, this idea of the return of Christ was so important and so popular, if you will, and so certain in the minds of the apostles that there are over 300 references to it in the New Testament. 300 references to the return of Christ in the New Testament. The angel himself said at Christ's ascension in Acts 1.9, he was taken up before their eyes and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently into the sky as he was going when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the way you have seen him go into heaven. Now, I think there's a lot that we want to know about the return of Christ when we think about that, when he returns, when he comes again. When will that be? What will that be like? What are the sequence of events that sort of lead up to that? And and that uh, discussion or that theology is known as eschatology. It's the study of his return and of the end times, the final state of things. And this might surprise you, but it's actually not my favorite topic. Um, it's, It's not simply because I find that there are so many debates over the sequence of things or the different schemes of how we think this might all happen. And it seems to me that people who have a great interest in eschatology often tend to be really dogmatic or really fearful or kind of 
obsessed and fixated on it in an unhealthy way. You know, they get the newspaper out with a marker circling things like, well, that's a fulfillment of problems. You know, and I kind of go, I don't, uh, there's better things to do with our time is what I want to say. Um, it is true. Christ told us to be watchful. He told us. It's, too, it's true that Jesus to, told us to be ready. But it is also true that Jesus told the disciples prior to his ascension about that day or hour, no one knows. Not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. He goes on at the end to say, therefore keep watch because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. So by way of application here, what I want to say is don't waste your energies in speculations, in fear, in doomsday prepping. When the Lord returns, you're not going to care how many MREs or how many 22 rounds you have. You will not care. Okay? The best thing Christians can do in light of the certain return of Christ is to live well for him now. To live well for him now. Growing in our discipleship and being faithful witnesses of his ministry and of his return. That is the best thing we can do now. And I want to tell you what, what I would urge you to do is this. Plan to live a full life on earth for Christ. Don't think, well, he's coming in three years, so I'm going to start tapering. <laughs> Plan to live a full life for Christ on earth and for his gospel. Hope for his immediate return but plan to live a whole life on earth. Uh, while I was down in Sitka, I met two brothers in Christ uh, who tune into our services regularly and then get together to talk about it. It was sweet to meet with them. But one, of, one complaint they both had <laughs> while I was there, I say, so Kent and Mike, shout out to you guys, hey. Uh, one complaint they had was, you know, one time you, you talked about you thought the return of Christ could still be decades away. That was discouraging. <laughs> and I can appreciate what they're saying there. But my point is this. Hope for his return. But plan to live your whole life as a faithful witness for him. There's no tapering and there's no quitting midway. And I think this is actually consistent with the very heart of God. Uh, that we would imitate. That we would be wanting and yet waiting patiently. Why? So that lost souls would come and hear and respond to the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. This is what it, uh, the Apostle Peter tells us in his second epistle. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. And the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will, be, will melt in the heat. But in keeping with his promise... We are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. Amen? You want to speed his coming? Get busy in your gospel witness. That's how you speed it up. So the tenor of the New Testament teaching on the return of Christ is this. It is meant to encourage faithful discipleship. We ought to live holy and godly lives. It's to give us assurance that Christ is victorious despite appearances to the contrary on earth, right? It is to give us hope. I think even to awake our imaginations of what the restoration of shalom will be like. Wholeness, goodness, peace, and all things as they ought to be. I think we should imagine those things. And it should prompt us towards readiness, which to some of you in the room right now, I'll say this. Some of you are holding, waiting, thinking you have all the time in the world to make a decision about what Christ has done for you. And I would tell you what the author of Hebrews has said, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. There is no guarantee you have tomorrow. Today, if he draws you, you respond. Get ready now. I love what Kevin Lewis has said. He's one of our CTF speakers and a professor at Talbot University. 
or Talbot Seminary rather, we were talking one time about um, eschatology and all the different schemes out there, and he said this, I have enough to deal with in my personal eschatology. I love that. I don't need to know what the next thousand years are going to be like. What do I have? 30? 40? 3? I have enough to deal with with my personal eschatology. I need to do business with God, and so do you. Lastly, he will return to judge the living and the dead. Uh, Judgment, not a very popular word or concept or doctrine or point of teaching in the church, especially when we consider how the world around us responds to this word. Somehow they think it turns God into a brute, makes him sound unfair, unreasonable. Uh, In fact, if you think about it, probably the two best known verses in all of scripture, I'm going to go with number one, this is just from the gut, number one, what do you think? John 3, 16? Yeah? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. The gospel in a verse. Uh, Second most popular or most well-known verse, lest you be judged. They know it in the King James, no less, right? (laughs) They've got that one, and they're ready to point the finger back at us in judgment, ironically. The world knows it. So judgment is not a favorite topic in the church or by unbelieving friends, and certainly not something that the progressive church wants to touch with a 10-foot pole. This should not be the case for Christians. Uh, First of all, let me just caution you. We do not need to be excited about judgment. And for some of you, that's a correction. Some of you are ready for God to come back and whack everybody who's been a knucklehead. We don't need to be excited about his judgment. But I would tell you, neither do we need to be ashamed of it because it is actually for our good. Um, It still, as you know, has horrendous implications because for every one of us here, there is someone that we love and care for and have prayed for who will fall under the harsh judgment of God because they have rejected Christ. And that is terrible. But I do want you to see that ultimately judgment is good. So let me say two things about the judgment of God. First of all, the judgment that Christians will receive is referred to in the scriptures as the judgment seat of Christ or the bema seat of Christ. And that is nothing for us to fear. Nothing to be afraid of. This is not a horrific moment that's coming for Christians where God is going to get out you know, the jumbotron and walk us through our life and say, Eric, 13 years old, what's happening here? Sophomore year in college, what's this scene all about? It's not going to be this terrible moment where all of these events are revisited against us. Okay? This is a moment we would call, best call it an award ceremony. This is where God does screen through our lives to determine what is worthy of reward or not. It is not a time where we are punished or reamed out for our sin, because that has been paid for in Christ. Amen? And as the scriptures say in Psalm 103, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. How far? From the east is to the west. That's how far. 2 Corinthians 5.10 speaks of the judgment seat of Christ. It says, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each of us may receive what is due us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. In other words, the deeds, good or bad, We're going to be determined for what we receive, what rewards will be given. Uh, Jesus taught the same thing in Matthew 16, 27, for the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what they have done. According to what they have done. This is the judgment of determination, of evaluation, not damnation. The judgment seat that awaits Christians is more like an award ceremony where he will evaluate our works to determine what is worthy of reward. And I will tell you this too, and I've been asked this question, what are we to do with these rewards we get in heaven? You ever think about that? Because there's some of you in this church, I'm like, I just want to live near Keith Payne. He's going to have some nice stuff. (laughs) 
that man's been a faithful servant a long time, you know? I just, I just want to be near him to borrow that cool stuff. I think the rewards that we're given in heaven are not for us to keep and have and hoard, but rather it is a way that God enriches us so that we will take these rewards and return them as gifts in honor and glory to Christ who saved us. I think it is enriching for giving, not for hoarding. But there is another judgment that awaits those who are outside of Christ. And this is referred to in the scripture as the great white throne. And I lovingly warn you, you do not want to be there. You do not want to be there. For it is there that God sentences those who are outside of Christ, who have rejected Christ's protection. And he sentences them not simply to non-existence, but to eternal conscious punishment. At that judgment, there is no appeal. There is no acquittal. There is no bargaining. There is no longer any hope. At that judgment, it is only sentencing for those who have rejected the refuge of Christ. That judgment is nothing to be glad about, for all of us will have loved ones there. But again, it is not anything to be ashamed about. If God did not judge, he would not be good. If God leaves abusers and liars and thieves and rapists and pedophiles unjudged, then heaven is nothing more than second earth, still rotten. If God is really going to restore shalom, peace and goodness and wholeness and all things as they ought to be, then he has to eradicate sin and evil in all of its forms. And we may say a hearty yes to that. Let it be so. Until we remember, wait a minute, I was a sinner too. We want God's judgment for sin. We want it eradicated. We just don't want his judgment to fall on us. But the good news of the gospel is that it will not. For those who have taken refuge in Christ, the judgment of God has already fallen on the Son and does not fall upon us. We are safe in him, forgiven in him. Our sins not dismissed or excused, paid for and punished in him. The picture of this great white throne is found in Revelation 20 verse 11. Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. The earth and the heavens fled from his presence and there was no place for them. I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne and books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. The sea gave up their dead that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And each person was judged according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. Anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. For those who are outside of Christ, who have rejected his sacrifice on their behalf, they are electing to take personal responsibility for the consequences of their sin. Therefore, judgment will fall squarely upon them as they have chosen. C.S. Lewis summarizes it well when he says this, there are only two kinds of people in the end. Those who say to God, Thy will be done. And those whom God, to whom God says in the end, Thy will be done. All that are in hell, choose it. Without that self-choice, there could be no hell. No soul that seriously and constantly desires joy will ever miss it. Those who seek, find. Those who knock, it is opened. And so I caution you, anyone who is here this morning with this, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts, but respond to the glorious gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let me pray for us. Father, we are conscious of our sin. Deep down, we all know it. We rejoice to see your holiness, your goodness, your loveliness. We rejoice 
that amazingly you would send your son to die in our place, to take our sins upon himself, to be judged for us, that he would be our sin and his righteousness transferred to us. Lord, I pray that if there's anyone here, that they would have a strong awareness, not only of the risen, exalted, and glorified Christ at the right hand of the Father, seated, but they would remember he is one who is coming back to judge the living and dead. May they take refuge in him. And for those of us who have, how sweet is our salvation. May we be about your works, living holy and godly lives, and be faithful witnesses for those who have not yet crossed the line of faith. Give us strength for these things, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.